welcome to the Standing Up to Pots podcast, otherwise known as the Potscast. This podcast is dedicated to educating and empowering the community about postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, commonly referred to as POTS. This invisible illness impacts millions, and we are committed to explaining the basics, raising awareness, exploring the research, and empowering patients to not only survive, but thrive. This is the Standing Up to POTS podcast. Hello, fellow POTS patients and cherished people who care about POTS patients. I'm Jill Brook, your hyperadrenergic host, and today we have an episode of The POTS Diaries, where we get to know someone in the POTS community and hear their story. So today we're speaking with someone I'm very excited to hear from. Her name is Jeannie Dibon, creator of the Zebra Club, whom I reached out to because two of our previous guests had mentioned that she had really helped them improve their quality of life. I don't want to give too much away. But Jeannie took her own experiences of suffering with POTS and related disorders, spent a long time finding some solutions for herself, and then also found ways to help other patients with the same issues. And now she has created a beautiful, successful business out of it. And as you may remember, I always love to hear stories about patients who have made their suffering mean something especially if it helps other patients have an easier time of things. And when I learned about Jeannie, she seemed to epitomize this. So I wanted to hear her story and how she did it all. Jeannie, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, thank you. And thank you for that beautiful introduction. Gosh, that was lovely. Thank you so much. (laughs) Well, I'm excited to hear about you. But for starters, Can you just start with some basics? Like, Mm. where are you? What is that lovely accent you have? Mm -hmm. What is your age? What is your current occupation? Yes. So, well, I'm based in Wimbledon in London, where you might know from uh, the famous tennis competition. I'm not far away from those tennis courts that you see on TV. But I grew up in Windsor. So, again, you might know from Windsor Castle and the royal family. So, This accent, I guess, is a Berkshire, a Windsor accent, now coming South London way. So I'm 52 this year, so 51 at the moment. Gosh, well, I've lived in Wimbledon for about 12 years now. So Lovely. And so what are a few words or phrases that your friends or family would use to describe your personality? Uh, Yeah, I was thinking about this. These questions are so hard, aren't they? Because you're like, oh, I hate talking about myself. (laughs) But, um, you know, I think they would say I'm definitely an empathetic person. So as you hinted at in the introduction, um, I do work with people now who have POTS, who have other conditions like EDS and mast cell activation. So I am a very empathetic person. And, you know, I'm I'm very determined. If someone comes to see me and they need help, I will pull out all the stops I can to try and find a solution, which isn't always easy, of course, with our community, because so many of us have lots of different things going on. So I think those would be two words that would be used to describe me. Very committed to my clients, to my work, to my, you know, everything I do. And so I imagine that you spend a ton of time on your work. But do you have favorite ways to spend your time when you're not working? Yes. Well, some people who might know me know that I've got a little dog, a little Havanese dog. So I spend a lot of time with him. and He gives me a lot of joy. I love being outside in nature. So one thing I really learned is that to calm my own nervous system and to look after myself, I need to be in nature. I love to be outside. I love to be near the water, near the sea. So I try to get out as much as I can, obviously energy and things permitting. But I also like to just relax and watch really nice things on Netflix a lot of the time. So (laughs) I do have downtime where I just sit and watch Netflix, (laughs) which is great. Great. (laughs) So you're not going to like this because I'm going to force you to not be humble. But if I made you brag about yourself, tell us about something you're really good at or your best trait or something, something that would be a brag. Yeah, you're right. I don't like this question. But, um, (laughs) you know, I think if I really had to say about myself, everything I do really comes from my heart. So every intention I have, every piece of work I put out there, it really comes from my heart. And it really is thinking about how I can help other people. So 
you know, I'm very proud. I am proud of, of, of what I do and I'm proud to be able to help our community. So yeah, I, that's probably what I'd say about that if I had to, if I had to. <laughs> I think you are open about the fact that you have POTS and hypermobility, EBS, and yes. MCAS, right? Yes. And yeah. have you always been affected by symptoms of these conditions, or did you have some years that were symptom-free before these things kicked in? Yeah, this is a really good question, and um, it's really odd because I do see my life in kind of two halves. But it doesn't mean that the first half was symptom free. It was just easier. So I've got two children. I should have said that. I've got two boys who are now 18 and 16. And I see my life sort of pre-pregnancy and post-pregnancy because pre-pregnancy, I had symptoms. But like many people, I didn't have a diagnosis. So you just learn to live with what you've got. And you just think that it's normal, that you have all these weird symptoms and things going on. But I wasn't really doing anything about it. I tried, you know, I saw lots of different people, but I just had to get on with my life. After my second pregnancy is when things started to go really, really badly wrong. And I got all the things, uh, chronic pain, lots of things, pneumonias, my heart valve prolapse got diagnosed, I, every chronic fatigue, everything kind of imploded. And so I see my life kind of pre and post pregnancy, but I've never really had a time in my life where I didn't have symptoms, unfortunately. So when these things started going wrong, what did you think was happening? Well, yeah, that's the thing. I just didn't know. I mean, there did get to a point where I thought there must be something really seriously wrong with me because there's always something wrong and it's always in a different part of my body. And there must be something really bad because I don't know. I'd been to so many doctors so and top people, you know, so consultants, And you know what it's like, you have scans, you have MRIs, you have tests, and they all come back, oh, that you're fine. I didn't know, but I was worried about it. You know, I remember when I was very young, like probably six or seven, it's really interesting when I was thinking about your questions. I remember at that age, recalling that a doctor, a GP, you know, just a normal regular doctor had told my mum that I had to have lettuce leaves covered in salt. So I had to be eating salt regularly. And I remember my mum forced feet. It was horrible, you know, just salt (laughs) on a lettuce leaf. And it was horrible. But I remember having to eat this because I don't remember clearly back then, but I obviously was having some kind of problems at a very early age. And some doctor who was obviously quite switched on, actually, back then, because that was, what, 1977, was telling my mum to give me salt. So symptoms were starting as early as that. Did anybody ever make you think that it was just stress or all in your head? And if so, what effect did that have on you? Yeah, all the time, all the time. So, uh, yeah, so I got diagnosed with IBS when I was 12. And I remember, and this obviously stayed with me, you know, for until recently. Um, And I remember going to see various doctors. And of course, for that kind of thing, they do tell you, oh, well, you need to practice relaxation. You know, you need to calm down. You need to, you're clearly stressed. That's why you're having stomach issues. I remember going to see a dental doctor because I was having a lot of TMJ pain. Ironically, I was already trained as a Pilates teacher at this point. And they're telling me, well, you should practice yoga or Pilates because you need to relax. You're clearly stressed. And I'm like, well, that's a little bit difficult because I'm already a teacher. So I kind of know all of this stuff. And they're like, oh, well, we don't know what to do with you then. But yes, so many times, so many times. And the worst one was going to see my doctor and being told, did I want antidepressants? Because I was clearly struggling. Or did I want to see a counsellor because I was clearly having lots of issues? And I'm like, I, I don't need counselling. I don't want antidepressants. I just want some answers. But As we all know, the doors get shut and nobody can really help you. So yes, lots of times, unfortunately, that has happened to me. And it makes you feel terrible. It makes you feel hopeless because what do you do? And then you start thinking, am I stressed? Am I depressed? I, you know, it's, it's, it's just not right that that happens to people. And I know it still happens to people. And so what developed into your very worst symptoms? I've always had really bad headaches and migraines. I've had pneumonia three times, so breathing problems, 
things got f- f- on the pot side of things. Obviously, I've lived with these symptoms for now I realize all of my life. They really got bad. I had COVID in 2020, December 2020. And they got really bad after COVID. So all those symptoms that I'd been living with and thinking, well, okay, I get a bit dizzy, I get a bit faint, I get, you know, things that, and in hindsight, you should, you know, it's crazy, you know, I can't have hot showers because I pass out, I can't go in a sauna because I faint, things like that, you know, you're like, well, that's not right, is it? <laughs> but um, it wasn't till I had COVID and then all of those symptoms and palpitations and the exercise fatigue, they got so much worse. And that's when I decided that I had to really investigate this. But lots of different things. Literally, I've had things wrong with all, pretty much every body part. One of the worst ones would be, which is due to the mast cells, not due to the pots, but repeated bladder infections. So for three years, constantly on antibiotics, trying to rid myself of this mast cell activation um, in the bladder. So yeah, lots of different things, really. Yeah. So I'm excited to move on to the part of your story where you kind of take control, take things into your own hands, find solutions and kick butt. Do you want to give us a snapshot of your darkest days before we get into the more positive part? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, as I said earlier, these things have been with me pretty much my whole life and um, things like like I said, about not being able to go in hot places, not being able to go in cold places, fainting, dizziness, blacking out, all of those sorts of things have pretty much always been going on in my life. But I think my darkest days, and like you say, the thing that sometimes you have to hit rock bottom, right, before you go, right, enough is enough. And it was after my second son was born. And I was so ill with the chronic fatigue and all the symptoms. Um, So I had a two-year-old son and I had a newborn. And I really, really struggled. I didn't have the energy. I felt like I was a failure as a mum because all the other mums wanted to do play dates and they wanted to go and do all these amazing things. And I just wanted to go home and I couldn't do any of those things. So I felt a real, real failure. And my chronic pain was getting worse and worse and worse. And really, that was when I said, right, something has to be done because... I can't live like this. I've got two small boys. I want to be a mum. And um, I'd never experienced fatigue like that ever, you know. So, yes, that's that was the darkest times, I think. Okay. And I think that you had mentioned that you already were a Pilates fitness instructor. And so that mm-hmm. sounds a little tough to do with EDS, well, body pain and fatigue. Well, no. So what happened, I wasn't a teacher back then. I didn't know anything. Ah, uh, okay. Had, if you saw me back then, so we're talking 2006, you wouldn't recognize me because I, I eventually saw a physio who said to me, you're just hanging off your joints. You have no stability. You're... I had zero idea about my body. I had zero body awareness. I didn't know anything. And so... I didn't understand chronic pain. I didn't know why I was in pain. I didn't know anything. It was, (laughs) so it was this physio who said to me, you need to start doing Pilates because you've got to start doing something to make yourself stronger. So I took his advice and I started doing Pilates in um, 2007. But I knew I fell in love with it immediately. And I started to train in 2008 to be a teacher myself. So that's when I I started to climb up out of that hole and started, like you say, to take control of of my life, my body, my symptoms. And yes, I did start to see improvements. And so that's what made me want to be a teacher. I was like, I need to know more about this. I want to just ignited a passion. And I was like, I want to know more about the body. I want to know more about why people move the way they do. I want to, I just want to know everything. And that started this. So I didn't just study Pilates. I went to do human dissections. I wanted to see inside the human body. I wanted to actually feel the muscles and the tissues. And I studied uh, biomechanics. I studied pain science. I just wanted to absorb everything I could. And I did. In my room, in my wardrobe, if you open the doors of my wardrobe, I could open a bookshop because I've probably got, I don't know, 500 books on all different types of disciplines and therapies and 
every book you can think of because I just wanted to know everything. Yeah, so taking control. Now, for anybody who's not really familiar with Pilates, do you mind Mm. just explaining what that is? Yes. So, well, not all Pilates is equal. I will say that because my Pilates is now, we call it modified Pilates because Pilates is, it was originated by Joseph Pilates. So there is a Mr. Pilates. He designed this whole movement system, which he called Contrology. So it's all about controlling the body and how you move. And there are lots of different schools. So if anyone's thinking of starting Pilates, you know, look into the different schools because there are some who are more sort of choreography driven and more athletic and more hardcore. But you can get remedial Pilates. You can get clinical Pilates. You really have to investigate and make sure you don't end up in the wrong sort of class. I've modified everything I learned about Pilates, put it together with all the other things that I studied to create a modified Pilates that I use for all of my clients. So my POTS, my EDS, my chronic fatigue people, they all follow this method that I've created. Right. I think I saw in one of your videos online that you had talked about in the beginning how you tried a lot of different movement therapies for yourself. Yes. And you, you found that with your POTS and your fatigue and your Ehlers-Danlos syndrome and your hypermobility, that so many of them just did not work for you. So yeah. you had to kind of question everything. Do you, yes. do you mind talking a little bit about that? Yeah. Yeah. That's absolutely right. So, I was always drawn to yoga, actually, maybe because I'm like many of my hypermobiles, we can do a lot of yoga things quite easily. But I was always in pain after the class. So I always had back pain, always had shoulder pain. And this was back in my first life when I had no awareness of my body. So I was just doing these poses and I didn't really understand them and I was pushing myself. So always in pain. So I knew, well, that's not quite right. But yeah, I've tried lots of different things. I've been to lots of different types of Pilates classes. There are many things in Pilates I would never, ever teach to any of my clients. There's a lots, of, lots of inversions, lots of things where involving the neck, lots of things, you know, you would never give to someone with POTS, for example, because they're going to really suffer for that afterwards. But yes, I did have to try lots of different things until I found my way. It was like, what does my body need to feel better? And the first thing it needed was, and it's the first two steps in my method, is breathing practice, because I didn't breathe properly either. I was very tense in my upper body. I was so used to bracing and guarding myself. So breathing and relaxation. And then from that, when you start to calm the nervous system down, you can actually start to get some nice movement coming. But if somebody's very tense, very anxious, very stressed, they're in pain, and you just throw them into an exercise class, it often doesn't end well because mentally we're not really on board with it. So that's how I learned what I needed to do, and that's what I now pass on to other people. Yeah, I'm guessing a lot of our listeners can relate to trying a lot of different things and then it just never works. I know that for myself, back before the pandemic, there were some lovely gyms with some lovely exercise classes around me and I would try them and every single class had a reason why I couldn't do it. You know, one room would be too hot. One exercise would be (laughs) too much standing. Why like, And I was always something with me. And I would always wonder, oh, man, what is wrong with me that I'm like the person who's too picky for any one of these things? And so that's what I love about what you did. Can we talk about what you have created? I mean, I guess for starters, you have written books about Pilates, right? Yes. Can you tell us about those? Yes. So... I wrote my first book, which was called Pilates Without Tears. And that was really to introduce my, as I say, my modified Pilates and try and introduce people that you can start to move. For me, it's not about how it looks and the choreography and everyone's doing it perfectly and everyone looks fabulous. You know, for me, it's always been about can I get someone to move safely and minimizing their pain or alleviating their pain if they're in pain. So my first book was really to introduce that idea that not all Pilates is equal. 
And then my second book came out in um, 2019 is uh, Hypermobility Without Tears. And that really focuses in on my six step program for people with hypermobility. So it's based, it's following on from the first book, but it's purely about how to move safely when you've got joint hypermobility. And the joke that I've heard a couple of patients say is that when they do your version of Pilates, they actually do get tears, but it's tears of joy because it's <laughs> yes. the first time they can do something. Yes. <laughs> and no, enjoy it. Exercise yes. is the source. You know, if you can do it, it's such a source of endorphins and relaxation yeah, and absolutely. sleeping well and helping everything feel better. And that's really a huge thing to have taken away from you. Absolutely. When you can't do it. So I, I really yeah. feel like when you give people a way to exercise again, you're giving them a lot more than just exercise. It's all those yeah. other good things that come with oh, it. Totally. Absolutely. You know, I have patients who are bed bound, who are in wheelchairs. To me, it doesn't matter where you are today. It doesn't matter what your starting point is. There is always something we can do. And those small steps, when you've been, like you say, there's a sense of loss because maybe you did have a very active life before and something happened and all of a sudden you've got all of these symptoms and you can't do, you can't even walk to the end of your street anymore. There's always something we can do, however small, because that small step is going to be a huge emotional step for you. Because you know how it is, we can feel so down, so upset, so frustrated without support often you know nobody understands what's wrong with us like I said right at the beginning I really get it because I've been there and I know how hard it is but I also know that even a tiny tiny step is going to make all the difference and that's what I want to communicate to people don't worry where you are today don't compare yourself to other people it doesn't matter it's about you and just making those tiny little improvements in any way we can. So you have created something kind of cool called the Zebra Club. Mm. Yes. What is that? Oh, well, the Zebra Club is, uh, I love how you say zebra. So we call it zebra over here. Oh. <laughs> but I, I much prefer your version. So the Zebra Club, it's really my heart's work. So really following on from what we were just saying, I wanted to create something that anyone could do at home anywhere in the world, because, you know, there is unfortunately not enough help and support out there for people with our conditions. So I wanted to make something that was, you know, affordable, that was you could do at home with hardly any equipment at all. It grows every month. I add new content every month. We have over 100 classes available in the app. But, you know, I've categorized them. So we have categories like sleep and fatigue. So for, for those days when you're just so tired and you don't want to do much, but, you know, it is important that we move, especially for our pots. It is important. So gentle nurturing classes. We've also got a section called mindful and stress. Again, on those days when you're not feeling great, but you want to do something. But we've also got classes for stability, pain management, strength and connect. So on the days where you're feeling a little bit more energized. And we've even introduced um, a cardio section because many of our members wanted to do cardio in a safe way. So there's no jumping around, there's no hit, you know, it's not that kind of thing, but it's safe cardio. So we've probably got something for everyone. And there are classes to sit in the chair, classes you can do in your bed. I've really tried to cover everything that people in our community might need. So I'm, again, I'm very proud of it. And, and the, I'm even more proud of the community that is part of the Zebra Club because our members, I do live meetings where people can come on Zoom and we chat, and we ch um, but we also have an inbuilt community page. And the support that people give each other is just amazing. It's a wonderful place to hang out. It really is. So just to make sure I understand what it all is. So the Zebra Club is <laughs> now an app. On people's devices, and it yes. has videos of yeah. exercise routines led by yes. you, also yeah. live meetings, um, and events. meetings, and then also kind of a way for people to support each other and have some yes. social interaction. Exactly, exactly. All under one roof. So you don't have to go anywhere. You can just pick up your phone or your laptop, and it's all there for you. So that is so cool. That is so wonderful. And I know that it has been a huge hit. And I know 
that your books and your apps have been featured on many media channels. And mm. I know that you've spoken to the Ehlers Danlos Society and a bunch of other places. Can you just talk about kind of what it's like to feel like your baby that came from your own struggle is now sort of being embraced all around the world? Like, how cool is that? <laughs> oh, well, yeah, I mean, it's amazing. Um, and as I said at the beginning, really, everything I do comes from my heart. My husband says I'm like a machine because I never stop thinking of ways that I can help people. You know, I do one that's like, well, how can I do more? What can I do? You know, like the YouTube channel, you know, not everyone can afford a subscription to the Zebra Club. So I'll always be creating content for my YouTube channel. You know, I want to help people, you know, as much as I can. But yeah, it's sometimes I have to pinch myself and say, wow, I can't believe that. <laughs> People in Australia are contacting me and people in, you know, all over the world are contacting me. And it's, it's um, yeah, I get very emotional about it because it means so much to me. You know, it, it's my life and it's, like you say, it's my struggle, but I've tried to turn that into something positive to help other people. It's amazing. and But I'm wondering, sometimes I think that success can be so wonderful and soothing for the brain, but then it means that your body has to do more, right? So now you're yeah. in more demand and more people want you. Has that been tough? Like how is your personal pain level and functionality mm. doing these days? Can you keep up with all of this <laughs> demand for your work? So luckily I don't have any pain anymore. So through my method through my movement method and, and conditioning myself, I got rid of my chronic pain. So I don't have pain. The things that I have to look after are my chronic fatigue syndrome and the POTS-like symptoms. So yes, that was a hard lesson. I had to learn to, it's not that I suffer physically, it's the mental stress, like the, the brain fogs. And I do have to, the hardest thing I had to do was make sure I built in rest into my day because I would just keep going, like you say, and then I would crash and that wasn't good. So one of the lovely things about having my little boy, my little dog, is I have to go out for walks at least once a day in the fresh air, in the sunshine. So that's part of my self-care. So self-care is so important. So it doesn't matter how busy I am. I try and stop work at 5 p.m., I make sure I try not to look at my phone. So I'm, I'm learning. I'm learning to be a little bit gentler on myself. So we have a couple questions that we always like to ask our guests because it might help other people. But yeah. besides what you've already talked about, is there anything you know now about living with POTS that you wish you had known sooner? Yes. Well, first, I wish I'd gone and had it investigated much sooner instead of waiting for long COVID to kind of push me into it. You know, I wish I'd known. I sort of knew I had POTS because I had all these symptoms and so many of my clients have it, but I really didn't know I had POTS. And I wish I'd known about salt. I mean, I know that sounds very simple, but I've recently been put on salt tablets and they have transformed my life. And I was like, <laughs> oh, if only I'd known about this sooner, my life would have been so much easier. Honestly, I have uh, no more jelly legs. I always used to have jelly legs like they were going to give way underneath me. My headaches have gone down. I even have more energy. It's like, wow, I should have done that That's sooner. <laughs> Along the same lines, are there any lessons that having POTS and related mm. conditions has taught you? Yes. I mean, kind of similar to what I was saying earlier, I have to pace myself. I have to learn to rest, um, which I'm doing. I have to, you know, take time out. And the thing I used to do before I was sort of officially diagnosed with POTS is that I don't know, it sounds really bad and that, you know, you think that, oh, you're just weak. You know, the fact that you get dizzy when you stand up or you can't walk a long way without feet or your heart pounding, you're just, you know, you're weak. There's something wrong with you. Just being kinder to myself and not pushing through those episodes. Like, no, this is something that's actually going on in my body. There's no, it doesn't mean I'm weak at all. I have to respect what my body is trying to tell me. And again, I wish I'd got my diagnosis a long time ago, but there you go. <laughs> right. Looking back, but what can you do? <laughs> 
So besides your career success, has anything positive come from your having POTS and related conditions? Any Mm -hmm. silver linings at all? Actually, yes, because A, it's led me to this wonderful, you know, I, I love my job. I love my career. It's led me down this path. And the amazing thing is that I've met so many wonderful people and our community is so wonderful. It's like you're... You're with people who finally understand you, that you feel accepted, that you're not weird, that there's nothing wrong with you. I've made so many friends on this journey, you know, and I get to meet all you amazing people and get to talk about this. So, yeah, lots of silver linings, actually, really. That's great. That's great. Are you up for what we like to call the POTS speed (laughs) round, where you just say the first thing that comes to your mind? (laughs) Okay, I'll give it a go. <laughs> and we know that your mind is not necessarily getting all the circulation it should, so that yes. just makes it that much more fun. Okay, okay. What is your favorite way to get salt? Through the salt tablets and the electrolytes that I take now. What is the drink that you find the most hydrating? Again, the electrolyte drinks. I have those every day. Again, only discovered those recently. I wish I'd known about them years ago. <laughs> <laughs> What is your favorite time of the day and why? Probably mid-morning. So early mornings, um, like many of us, or I'm a bit groggy and not great when I first get up in the morning. But by the afternoon, I tend to get a bit fatigued. So mid-morning is super nice. I have my most energy at that time. How many doctors do you think you have seen for POTS, MCAS, EDS, the, the whole package? Oh, gosh, so many, so many to count. Lots of cardiologists, but only seeing Dr. Gould, who you might have heard of, who's, you know, here in London. He was the person who diagnosed me with POTS. But I've seen so many different doctors and nobody joined the dots for a long, long time. So I know you have worked with many POTS patients through your Mm. app and virtually, but how many have you ever met in the flesh face to face? Oh, honestly, I would say most of my patients face to face have some level of POTS. So lots and lots and lots. I met my very first POTS patient in 2013. And she taught me, we became friends, she was a client. And she taught me so much about POTS just from working with her. Great. What is one word that describes what it's like living with chronic illness? Unpredictable. Hmm. <laughs> What is some good advice anyone ever gave you about anything? So I was thinking about this in terms of, you know, living with chronic illness. And I think the best advice someone gave me was acceptance, because, you know, I think most people go through a stage where they do try and fight this and they're angry and they're stressed by everything. And actually, this thing's probably not ever going to go away. It's with us. It's part of who we are. And so learning to accept that really helped calm everything down. Oh, that's a good one. Um, It comes from a fellow potsy person. You know, I hear that pretty often. And it just makes me think, you know, so if you are a listener, and you have pots right now, and you have worked with anyone, and you have talked about your pots, there's a chance that you really taught them something that they passed on to someone else, and it changed how they did. And like, this is at such a point of beginning that each one of us can make a difference with the conversations we have and the people we educated. Who is someone you admire? Honestly, I admire anyone who has overcome some kind of adversity. And if that, you know, living with a chronic illness or anything that they've overcome in their life, because it takes courage, it takes determination. And I just think everyone who who is living with these conditions is just amazing. Because we do have to face so much. And as we all know, our condition is invisible, you know, so people don't really, sometimes they don't believe us, you know, we look well a lot of the time. So it's really hard on a daily basis. So I admire every single person who gets up and deals with this every day. Great. What is something small that brings you comfort or joy? Well, apart from my little dog, who's wonderful, I love lying in my bedroom when the sunlight's coming in and just lying in there and resting and feeling the sun and looking outside and seeing the trees. And I like just lying there. (laughs) It just makes me feel really good. (laughs) 
What is something you're grateful for? Very grateful for my family and their support and their you know support of me through my health struggles, but also through my work. They're so supportive of everything I do. So really, I would say that. So I just have a couple more questions. Yeah. What do you wish more people knew about POTS and related conditions? Well, as I was just said, the fact that it's invisible, I wish people would understand that just because something is invisible, it doesn't mean that people aren't feeling really, really ill inside and they're just being, they're just not showing it because we have to function. If people could just understand that, that there's a lot going on underneath the surface that people are hiding and they don't want to talk about or they, you know, they can't talk about. And um, yeah, I think that's so important with these invisible illnesses. Is there anything at all you would want to say to your fellow POTS patients out there who may be <laughs> listening? Well, I am very late to the party, to the POTS party, because as I say, I only got diagnosed officially last year. I'd like to say, you know, thank you, because I'm learning every day more about this condition and and your fabulous website and your podcasts or your POTS casts that you do. So, you know, I'm learning all the time from all of you. So thank you, because I'm on a journey as well, learning more about POTS every day. <laughs> That's what I love about this community is it really is like, obviously, you're doing stuff to help everybody and they're teaching you stuff and we're all lifting each other up. It feels yeah. like I just love that. Okay, yeah. so where can people find all your stuff online, your books, your yeah. Zebra Club, your, your YouTube? Yes. Um, so the best place to go is my website, which is geniedebon.com. That's got links to my books, to the Zebra Club. YouTube is obviously just my name, Jeannie Debon. You can just search me up on there. And I post, try to post new content every week. So classes, tips, podcasts. So yes, that's probably the best place to go. And I'm on all the social medias as well. Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Perfect. So Jeannie Debon, and that's... D-I-B-O-N for yes, your last name, right? Exactly. All one word and Jeannie with a double N. <laughs> well, Jeannie, thank you so much for sharing your story and your insights with us. And thank you for making all of your suffering mean something to help others. That thank is you. awesome. And hey, listeners, remember, this is not medical, dental, spiritual, fashion or menu advice. Consult your medical team about what's right for you. Please consider subscribing because it helps us get found by more people like you. But thank you for listening. Remember, you're not alone. Keep up the good fight and please join us again soon. You can find us wherever you get your podcasts or on our website, www.standinguptopots.org slash podcast. And I would add, if you have any ideas or topics you'd like to suggest, send them in. You can also engage with us on social media at the handle Standing Up to Pots. Thanks for listening, and we hope you join us. This show is a production of Standing Up to Pots.